So today's event is part of a series of stories of hope that we are presenting to you. And this is a really beautiful one today. So let me turn to our two speakers and I'm going to introduce them now. Dr. Mordecai Paldiel was for 25 years the director of the Department for the Righteous at Yad Vashem. And uh, so he oversaw the files of many, many people who were nominated to become righteous among the nations. And he is currently working on this particular group that we're talking about today, the, the Ladosh or Wadosh group. Um, one person has been honored, other people need to be honored. So he can certainly tell you all about that. He has written many books about uh, Holocaust rescue, particularly the righteous diplomats. And currently he is finishing a book on Poland, the Holocaust and the Jews. So he is a particular expert on Poland. He himself uh, was a Polish citizen, although born in Belgium. He, he also has a personal connection to Switzerland, which is tied to this story, and he can explain all that at some point during today's hour. Ambassador Jakub Kumo is the Polish ambassador to Turkey. So he is calling in from Ankara, Turkey, which is why we're having today's event a little on the early side, because he is seven hours ahead. So it's 1 p.m. now in New York, it's 8 p.m. in Turkey, and we're so privileged to have him with us here today. Ambassador Kumoch used to be the Polish ambassador to Switzerland, and in that role, he was approached by someone who told him that his predecessor, sitting in that chair during World War II, had done something unbelievable. And Ambassador Kumok did not know the story at the time, and he has since made himself the world's expert on today's story. So Ambassador, let's start with you. Uh, what would you like to, how would you like to start today's conversation, please? First, first of all, by turning my microphone. Does, anybody, does everybody hear me? Thumbs up. No, can no, you, can no. you? Just, people can give a thumbs up if they hear you. Okay, thank you very much for this invitation and thank you very much for being here. I'm really, I, I, I've been trying to find out who else is, is, is sitting there. I, 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 I could find at least five direct survivors who were in possessions of, so, possession of so-called Wadosh passport during the Holocaust. So uh, Marion, Steve, Uri and Leonie, uh, I'm really pleased to, to see you. Sorry if I haven't spotted somebody else, but, um, but uh, I'm not very technologically that advanced to, to be able to, to see who else is there. Um, well, first of all, it's a great pleasure. Secondly, uh, it's a pleasure that it's uh, Susan Mendes Foundation who, who's organizing that. Susan Mendes is a person who saved a lot of Polish Jews as well, including a very famous, one of the most famous poets of the 20th century, Julian Tuvin. So uh, this is a person who is, who is also recognized in Poland as a massive, as we say, massive Holocaust rescuer. Um, now, uh, what happened to me? I was ambassador. I became ambassador of Poland in... Uh, in 2016 and shortly after Marcus Blechner who is a son of Holocaust survivor and our honorary consul in Zurich came to me and 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 spoke about Alexander Wadosh well I at that time I believe that everything has been already said about Holocaust and it is not possible that somebody who apparently tried to rescue 10,000 people or even more could be that easily forgotten uh, we started verifying his story in the federal archives of Switzerland and later on the Polish archives and we found out that this is a story which basically every country would be proud to tell the world of, but Poland somehow failed to do it. Failed to do it because we, we didn't know. I have never heard I had never heard the name Wadosh before. So that's how it started. Uh, after the first articles, I was conducted by, by some survivors and their, their descendants who told me, you know, that their ancestors had the same passports. Passports who basically rescued people's lives 
uh, in a different way than the than Sousa Mendes documents. Sousa Mendes represented a sovereign, independent, non-belligerent country. So getting to this country would save everybody's life. I mean, everybody who was in Portugal was safe. Now the government of Portugal forbade him from, from issuing visas to the, to, to, to the Jews, which he disobeyed, thus saving lives of people. Now, Alexander Wadish was a Polish ambassador. He represented the government in, of Poland in exile. The government which in 1939 left Poland to continue the struggle against the Germans. Uh, all the uh, embassies and legations, which were at that time Polish legations, were loyal to the government. So the government possessed army, possessed diplomacy, possessed fleet, and uh, loyalty of the citizens abroad. But Poland itself was occupied. So no document uh, permitting anybody to migrate to Poland was a really life-saving document. It was, it was quite opposite. That's why this group of people, my pre former predecessor and his diplomats invented another, another way, uh, forging passports of other countries, of countries who were distant at that time, who did not really have, uh, well, developed international relations with Europe, countries like Paraguay, Honduras, Haiti, and in, one, in several particular cases, uh, Peru. They believed that those Jews who will be able to, to, say the Germ to tell the Germans, look, I have a passport of a Latin American country, that these people are going to be spared from deportations. And in some cases it worked like that. In other cases, it did not work. But uh, in many cases in the German occupied Holland, where many, pa when it, many passports were sent, it indeed worked this way. Instead of being sent to Auschwitz-Birkenau or Sobibor and murdered there, the holders of passports were sometimes, in many cases, kept in the first Camp Westerbork and then in Bergen-Belsen, where many of them lived until 1945 and witnessed their liberation. And I think this is a very basic knowledge about what, 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 what we have seen. The movie has, is excellent. I, I can see Jacek Papis who actually contributed, who, who, who is a co-director of the movie. But of course the story is sometimes different than the movie. I, I would probably better place to, to, to answer some, de some, some detailed questions after, after Dr. Pardiel tells a few words because he's much, he's, a, he's an expert on Holocaust. I'm ju I just, happened to discover a story. Thank you. Dr. Paldiel? Okay, so uh, uh, I will start by saying uh, during my many years of work at Yad Vashem, I was involved in honoring thousands of non-Jews for saving Jews, among them thousands of uh, Polish citizens. I hosted many ceremonies, I kissed many hands of Polish women, uh, as is customary in Poland, and doing these ceremonies. And uh, all the stories that we at Yad Vashem uh, confirmed are for people, individual people who sheltered, mostly sheltered Jews in their homes, or they provided them with false uh, uh, documents, or they helped them with uh, crossing the border, or they, uh, they uh, picked up the children, and took them to them like, uh, and there was an organization in Poland called the uh, Zygota that uh, helped uh, thousands of Jews. And so uh, I was involved in thousands of cases, but I never came across a story like this one, never before. Also, I also dealt with diplomats who helped Jews by giving them legitimate visas to their countries. Okay, uh, Sugihara and Karl Lutz and so on. Uh, but I never came with a story like this. Uh, I only heard about this last year. Uh, it was not publicized. Uh, no one wrote about this. And what is, makes the story so unique and highly unusual uh, is for diplomats to be involved in issuing uh, false passports uh, of another country 
not of their own country, uh, without that country's, without the other country's knowledge, and to issue it to its own citizens. What's happening here is Polish diplomats in Switzerland are converting Polish citizens into citizens of Paraguay, Peru, Honduras, without the knowledge of these governments. <laughs> now, this is something really out of this world. <laughs> and the reason they did it in order to save their lives. This is like a complicity of goodness. So I never came across such a story. And there is no similar story like this. Uh, you mentioned Mendes, and of course I was involved in the Susan Mendes. Well, he gave legitimate uh, Portuguese uh, transit visas, but not here, these fake visas. Uh, so that's number one. Number two, here we have an operation, a combined Polish Jewish operation. They're working so close with each other. And these Jewish people, all right, Avram Zilberschein, Rabbi Chaim Israel uh, Eis, uh, the Sternbuch couple. Uh, and then there was a Jewish person who was hired by the Polish legation to work inside the Polish legation, uh, Mr. Dr. Julius Shekul. And they're working so close together to try to save as many Jewish lives, mostly Polish citizens, but not, not necessarily. I came across uh, the story, which uh, I literally fell off my chair. Uh, the story of Josef Burg, who is a German citizen and gets a Polish passport so he can leave uh, Switzerland and go back to Palestine. I came, and then the story of Pierre Mendes France, who is a French citizen, no relation to Poland, <laughs> and he gets a Polish passport under the name of Jan Lemberg, which makes it possible for him uh, to uh, 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 by step uh, uh, Vichy France. They were looking for him and go to London and join the forces of the goal. Uh, and so uh, when I learned about the story, uh, I felt that a person like Lados and Renievich really deserved to be honored by Yad Vashem. So I was frankly very disappointed when I learned that uh, of the, the main, the principal uh, activists in this operation, which were, first of all, the ambassador himself, uh, Alexander Lados, and then Stefan Renievich, uh, they were left out. And the only person that was honored uh, by Yad Vashem uh, was Konstanty Rokitsky, who, who deserves to be honored. He was involved, but uh, he was taking orders from his superiors. And so I don't understand what happened there. It's possible that Yad Vashem didn't get the full information or they misinterpreted that or they got the wrong conclusion. I was not there. When I came upon the story, this was already a closed thing. So right now I am working very dil diligently and I'm in touch with Yad Vashem to try to reopen the case. And I, I, su I supplied them with dozens of documents uh, that Ambassador Kumosh and his aide Oshinsky made uh, available to me. Uh, many of these documents are in uh, English, some are in Polish, we were translated in English and I forwarded to Yad Vashem and I'm waiting for them uh, to reopen this case so we can have all the three main Polish diplomats, not only one, uh, to be honored uh, by Yad Vashem. So I want, just want to add that these Polish diplomats were stationed in Switzerland. Switzerland was following a policy of strict neutrality. They were constantly in fear of a German invasion, okay? Uh, the Germans considered most Swiss to be Aryans because most Swiss people speak German. And so the Swiss, in order to avoid the German invasion, they followed a strict neutrality and nothing was to be done uh, in, to, to uh, subvert that. And here you have three Polish diplomats that are subverting the Swiss and the neutrality. They are issuing these false passports to make it possible for Jews to get out from uh, German uh, control, okay? Uh, and so you can imagine how the Swiss felt furious at these people. Uh, the Swiss foreign minister invited uh, Ladas, the ambassador, and they had a very shouting conversation. Uh, but at the same time, the Swiss withheld from uh, punitive measures because by the time that they got a hold of the story, uh, the military situation uh, had changed, the balance of powers have changed, and Germany was beginning to lose the war. And so maybe they decided they're going to hold back and they don't want to punish uh, the, the Polish diplomat, but the Polish diplomat didn't know that at the beginning, 
when they in, when they initiated that. So this is an initiative taken by the Polish ambassador in Bern later on with the full support of his government, but he could not tell his government that he was issuing false, or he was involved in a scheme to issue false Paraguay passports. He couldn't tell it to, to his government at the beginning because if Paraguay would discover that, they would ask the Polish government in exile, did you, did you permit your ambassador to do that? And if they had said yes, you can imagine the scandal that would have uh, exploded. So he, he, he understood that, Ladoš. Uh, so sadly, he was never acknowledged, uh, never honored. He died in Warsaw peacefully after the war, he came back. So now uh, I am very much involved uh, together with others, with, with Ambassador Kumos, uh, with uh, Markus Blechner, who is the uh, honorary consul of uh, Poland in Zurich. He happens to be Jewish. His parents come from Germany. So I'm very much involved now with Yad Vashem to try to correct. And I believe it will be corrected. Uh, it's going to take some time to, uh, because of the uh, Corona thing. Uh, Yad Vashem uh, is way behind in, in the handling its cases. Uh, so there will be more news on, uh, on this story. Again, I close and say this is a story which has no parallel among all the other stories that Yad Vashem has honored the people as righteous among the nations. Dr. Paldiel, can I just ask you to explain to everybody what is the process at Yad Vashem for somebody, a rescuer, to be made a righteous among the nations? The process is very simple. A person submits a request. Usually the person who submits the request to have somebody honored is the person who was helped by that, that other person. And he submits a statement, a bona fide statement, signature has to be uh, notarized, in which he says, I was saved by this person, and here is the story, okay? Uh, then there might be another, there may be another witness. Uh, the rescuer himself, uh, the, the rescuer's family may add some more information, but the basic uh, instrument is the testimony of the survivor. Uh, then this goes before a special commission. The commission was changed by a judge of the Supreme Court. The commission is like a jury. Now, the criteria for receiving the title of righteous among the nations is either a person who helped Jews in a place where uh, that was controlled by the Germans or a collaborating country. In other words, he stood at risk to lose his life or his freedom in case this was discovered. So he, was, he helped the Jews at his own risk. That's number one. Number two, he did not condition that help with uh, uh, substantial monetary compensation. There was no uh, condition attached to that at uh, the beginning. Uh, that person was not a collaborator. There were some persons who helped you and also uh, collaborated. We have the statement of uh, the survivor who was helped. Uh, and uh, the, that's it. And the commission would then uh, approve that and persons are being honored whether they're still alive or posthumously. Uh, that is the basic uh, way that this is being done. Ambassador. Uh, please unmute yourself. Well, yes, just to add a few words. Um, well, I'm not that, of course, I, I, absolutely, I, I'm really thankful, grateful, and I appreciate the, the work of, of Dr. Dr. Paldiel uh, in what concerns the title of writers among the nations. But um, being concentrated, if, if, from my point of view, and from my Polish point of view, non-Jewish point of view, being concentrated too much on writers among the nation would also, um, in my case, a bit diminish the role of those members of what we call the Wadish group who are not eligible to get this title, meaning three Jewish members of the group. Uh, let me remind you that uh, among the six people we identified as the real heroes, three were indeed Polish Catholics, but three were Polish Jews. Uh, it included Dr. Juliusz Kuhl, Polish diplomat, it included uh, Chaim Eis, the leader of Agudat Israel in, um, in Zurich, a completely forgotten person, uh, very seldom mentioned, um, a religious man who 
Well, I may, I can, I can, I can say paid the highest price. He died of, of, of heart attack in uh, late 1943, being persecuted, prosecu persecuted by the Swiss police. Um, probably there is a big link between his premature de death and his 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 activity. There was also Abraham Zilberschein, the representative of, of the World Jewish Congress. They were all, I mean, without them, Polish diplomats would not even know the names of the uh, Jewish people to rescue because in this particular operation, the rescuers didn't know the, didn't know anything about the persons, the persons they tried to rescue. They didn't know them. There were just names for them. They just, they just knew they were rescuing human lives, but they didn't know who these people were. They were just issuing one passport after another. You know, I have one such a passport and such a passport with me. This is a copy of a Paraguayan passport. Look, when I open it, I'll try to, 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 to show. This is a copy, but I mean, a, a, a perfectly made copy of a Paraguayan passport for a Jewish German family. These people were not citizens of Poland. You can see three pictures, parents, one son, and two other children. The family of five who survived the Holocaust. Um, this passport were in, in, in I mean, Wadosz did not know them. Wadosz just received a, uh, an order from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Poland, please organize a, a Latin American passport for the family of Herbert Kruskal. He did it. Uh, we don't know why Herbert Kruskal was selected by the government. Probably he, 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 he had some, I don't know, political, political meaning or a Jewish organization asked for help. But this is a rescue operation where rescuers didn't know the rescued ones. They didn't even know what happened to them. They couldn't help them more but by producing the document. And uh, uh, coming back to the Jewish members of the operation, we have identified at least three Poles who knew about it and who actively participated in, uh, in it. But there were tens of Jewish people who provided them with, uh, with uh, personal data, with passport pictures. Well, these pictures somehow made, made their way from, from, from London or from, from Warsaw to, 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 to Switzerland. Uh, I can see, for example, here, I, I, as, as far as I, as I understand, I'm speaking also the daughter of one of, of those heroes, uh, Rabbi Weingott, who was very active in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in uh, obtaining the passports. Um, uh, people like Schwalbe, like Schwarzbaum in, in, in the Benjin ghetto many Jewish members of the Jewish resistance sometimes, who sometimes have pass, had passports themselves, like, for example, Gizi Fleischmann in Slovakia. They were doing it to rescue other Jewish people too. So, um, so concentrating from my perspective, uh, maybe I'm more, pre more entitled to say so because uh, I'm Polish, but from my perspective, I, I would be, of course, I would be honored if my former predecessor is um, um, recognize as writers among the nations, but my duty is to have all the participants duly recognized, including the Jewish ones. And I'm really proud that um, uh, in 2019, the president of Poland granted posthumous medals to all what we six members of the uh, Wadash group and uh, the families of Dr. Dr. Kuhl and uh, the um, representative of, of, of uh, the family of um, of Heim Eis were there. So, 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 so this is this is something. This is something I, I would like to achieve to, to honor all of them, regardless of their ethnicity, nationality, and religion. I would like to I would like to add something to what the ambassador said. I fully agree with you, Ambassador, about the Jewish rescuers. Well, we've got a problem here that Yad Vashem does not honor Jewish oh. rescuers, okay, only non-Jewish. And uh, I belong to an organization in Israel where we're trying to convince Yad Vashem to open a program so we can honor Jewish rescuers. But so far we have not succeeded. So I belong to, a, to uh, an organization which is headed by B'nai B'rit, the Jewish organization in Israel, and we are honoring Jewish rescuers. And I will definitely submit the name of the principal Jewish persons, Avram Zilberstein, uh, Rabbi Eis, the Sternbuch couple, and Julius Kuhl, 
that they should be honored by a Jewish rescuers. And today it can only be done by the B'nai Brit organization. Yad Vashem refuses uh, strenuously uh, to have a program to honor Jewish rescuers on the claim that Jews who, say, who helped Jews, they were simply doing what was required of them, which I find uh, not convincing to say the least, because one can say this for every rescuer, that if a person sheltered a Jew in his home, maybe he was doing what was morally required. But anyway, I fully agree with you, ambassadors, that these persons that you mentioned uh, sh surely uh, should be honored uh, by, uh, by, the, by the Jewish people first, because they're, they're Jews. And uh, hopefully Yad Vashem will come around uh, uh, to that conclusion as well. So we've reached, we've reached the midpoint of the program. So I'd like to start involving some of the questions from the listeners, the, the participants. Uh, there are already a few. So uh, one is uh, the first question that was on my mind after I finished watching the film, which was how many of the recipients of Paraguay passports ended up in Paraguay? Dr. Palgelmi. <laughs> well, according to our, our knowledge, no one. No one, because these passports were not meant to cross the border using them. Uh, the, if everybody, and there were as many as 10,000 people having Wadish passports, if any, all of them tried to cross Swiss or Spanish borders, the local authorities would, be in, would have been immediately alarmed that there are mass, there's a massive number of fake documents on the black market in the occupied Europe. The idea was not to let them leave the Nazi-held territory, but to um, force the Nazis to intern them instead of killing them, so that they may be exchanged against the Germans held by, held by the uh, allied countries. At the very beginning, many people believed that there were thousands of Germans in the hands of countries like Paraguay, like Argentina, like Brazil, like uh, Peru, like uh, the United States, who would be eagerly exchanged against, against uh, these, uh, these Jews. But in 1944, it was already clear that there were not many Germans um, naive enough to, to be willing to come back to the Third Reich because the Germany was definitely losing war. So um, a very almost famous, but sometimes I mean, misappreciated um, uh, Jewish family from Switzerland, the Sternbuch family, and their Wat Hatzalal committee had another idea in 1944 was to bribe the Nazis and to enable the, the exchange this way. There were few exchanges of the passport, so-called uh, Wadish passport owners, but most of them were not exchanged. They were liberated, those who survived, and we have documented, uh, as far as I understand, uh, I remember more than 830 cases of survival, people known by name, because there are many others who are not known till now. Most of them were liberated, liberated in Bergen-Belsen, in Theresienstadt, in the lost train in Trebitz. Uh, Many of them also died in the last, uh, last weeks of the, of the war, but they were not murdered, exterminated. They, they died in, 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 in concentration camps. So let's go to the next question. I just Would want to add uh, here that uh, it is quite possible that uh, some of these people who received the Paraguayan passports and uh, later on, after the war, they wanted to go to Paraguay for, uh, and they saw they applied for a legitimate legitimate Paraguayan passport. So uh, uh, we shouldn't cancel out that none of them ever got to Paraguay, but if they did, not on the fake passports, okay? That's, That's yeah, of course, it, it might have happened, but, but, yeah. but we don't know any case of any survivor who has ever been to Paraguay after the war. We know one case of a person who migrated to, to Brazil, but it's unrelated to the, to the story of Paraguay. It's unrelated to Paraguay. As an American passport was used only as fake papers uh, meant to, uh, to, to, to save people from the deportation to the death uh, So we have a, a question from someone whose family is mentioned on the list, two uncles, uh, who never mentioned any passports. So the question is, were all the passports distributed 
And then was there a local group in the Benjing area coordinating the issue and the delivery of these passports? Uh, well, defin definitely not all the passports were distributed. First of all, the group basically produced passports, but the passports remained in Switzerland with the Jewish organizations. Most of your ancestors received only copies of their passports so that they couldn't travel. Basically, uh, a lot of people uh, did not receive their passports at all because the Nazis seized them. But even seizing the passport didn't mean that a person was meant to be killed. Some Nazi officers used them as a kind of bribe, as a kind of, you know, potential, for, use them for potential gain. So, uh, for example, I know several stories of some of you who, has ne who have never learned about any passports, but still their ancestors are on the list of people for exchange. For example, they were, they were imprisoned in Bergen-Belsen and in, in, in February 1945, a list of 646 names of people having Latin American nationality was prepared for the World Jewish Congress. They are on the list, although they didn't know that they had passports. Why? It was so because the, the Nazi administration took their passport and then didn't say them a word. But they, they were still trying to bargain, trying to trying to, 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 to use this opportunity. There were other people who had their passports, but still they were not spared from deportation. For example, a passport like that was found in 1992 uh, after the death of, a, of an Israeli citizen who, whose family knew that he was in Auschwitz. So it meant that the person somehow smuggled the passport to Auschwitz. He had it through the death march. Probably he treated this as his last parachute, as last chance of survival. Did this passport really contribute to his survivor? Survival? I would, I would argue somehow yes, because if it was that important to him, that probably increased his will of survival. Survival. There are many, many stories, but, but no, not all the passport owners indeed received their passports. It's, it's absolutely clear to me. I want, I want to add to that. Many of these passports that were sent to the people, like in the Warsaw Ghetto, these people were, not, were already not, no longer alive, they were killed. And so these passports landed in German hands and they, they began to trade these passports for others. They began to sell it. So there was a big trade happening with these uh, uh, passports and it landed in other people's hands. I just want to add another comment. In addition to these passports, uh, what was issued was what was called promessas. In other words, people who could not get a passport because we didn't have the full names or the photos or the date of birth, they were issued letters, again, signed by the uh, 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 Paraguayan Consul General stating that they are citizens of Paraguay. They are like citizenship papers, which was of course completely false. Now, the, the man in the Paraguayan uh, consul, uh, general, uh, consulate office uh, was a Swiss man. His name was Rudolf Hugli. And of course, he sold these passports in return for payment. And when the, his government found out about this, of course, he was fired. Uh, but uh, it's thanks to him that we got all these, uh, these uh, empty passports. But he did it, some say, for a mixture of humanitarian and also financial uh, considerations. So th there were several questions uh, exactly about that. This Hughley, the honorary consul, whether he was doing it out of the goodness of his heart or whether he made money, I guess he did it for money. And then there's a question here for Dr. Paldiel. Yes. Do we know if the Polish legation in Bern was in touch with the Salvador consulate in Geneva, George Mandel Mantello and uh, Jos uh, Jose Arturo de Castellanos, who both issued a lot of letters of protection and Salvadorian passports for European Jews. Okay, I don't think they were in touch, but uh, Montello, who happens to be Jewish, his real name was Mondel, he changed his name to Montello so he could appear most uh, Spanish speaking, and he worked for the El Salvador uh, consulate in Geneva. So he was issuing Salvadorian citizenship papers uh, he did that on his own. He had a lot of money and he had his own team of workers. This man, George Mandel uh, Montello. He did not necessarily work with the uh, Polish legation uh, and the Jewish activists there. He, uh, he did it on his own. 
He also saved uh, many Jewish uh, lives, uh, but he was in touch sometimes with, uh, uh, with the Sternbuch couple, but he was not directly in touch with the Polish legation. That doesn't mean that the Polish legation people did not know of uh, Mandel Mantello. Uh, he was Jewish. Uh, the Salvadoran diplomat, his name was Castellanos, and uh, he was honored as uh, by Yad Vashem as a righteous among the nations. I was involved in that. I helped out. Uh, it was a difficult process, but he was involved because he uh, allowed this, uh, his, this Jewish secretary who worked in, in his consulate to issue uh, citizenship papers from Salvador without getting prior approval by his government. So uh, this is another story that originated in Switzerland and has been completed. So there's a question, which is uh, for Ambassador Akumosh. Um, how did you identify the 3,000 plus names and how can people see this list? Right, right. Thank you very much for this question. Um, this is the result of our common work with uh, four institutions in Poland and outside Poland. We started doing it by, our, uh, by ourselves, Jędrzej and I. Um, later on, we were joined by Pilecki Institute, Pilecki named after Witold Pilecki, the Polish army officer who voluntarily were in prison, was imprisoned in Auschwitz to document the atrocities there. Pilecki, and he prepared the Pilecki report later after the war, he was shot, murdered by the communist regime in 1948. Um, it, later on, uh, Auschwitz-Birkenau Museum joined us in our researches and later we received also support for the Polish Institute of National Remembrance and the Jewish Historical Institute in Warsaw. And many, many survivors whom, whom we met him, who, to whom I'm really thankful for, his, for, their, for their help. Uh, now, what we did was uh, trying to find, uh, find the lists of people um, list of uh, owners of Latin American passports prepared by the administration of Nazi concentration camps in the, at, the, uh, at the late phase of the war. So there are lists like that. For example, lists of uh, inmates in Vitel, the, 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 the camp which was liquidated. Um, a list of uh, Latin American passport owners in Bergen-Belsen. Uh, list of uh, prisoners in some other um, uh, and other concentration camps. All of them claimed that they had Latin American passports. So we entered every name into a database. Later on, we added all those names who appeared on uh, the several hundred passports we found. I mean, copies of the passports. They can be easily, uh, easily found at Yad Vashem. Um, they are, the, the, the photocopies are there. Later on, we found also an exchange between uh, Abraham Zilberschein, who was, I would say, the biggest accountant of this, of this, of this operation, and Consul Rokitsky, who was the direct, direct uh, forger. Um, every name, uh, and, and of course, and, and there were many, 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 many books, many memoirs written about, about the, what happened in, in Switzerland. The police also possessed some information. So we entered every single name we found. Later on, we Googled. We Googled. We simply Googled what happened with these people and we found out that there were, there, there were excellent Jewish databases it did, in, in, in the internet. You have uh, Gini Commune, Jewish Gini, you, you have a lot of I mean, genealogy is something, I mean, Jewish communities are very well known and appreciated for it. You have excellent, excellent researches concerning this, this, uh, this, uh, this branch of, 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 of science, of history. Um, uh, so we could decide more or less what happened to most of these people. And um, later on, we applied the, the other tools like, um, for example, uh, there is a big data in, at Bad Arles and everybody know, knows it's the international tracking system. So every name was checked, verified at, the, uh, at Bad Arles. And we have the database of uh, prisoners, inmates in Auschwitz-Birkenau. It's not full, but still uh, the museum helped us identify many of, 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 of people. Um, plus, uh, there are databases of um, uh, people who lived in, in, the, in the ghetto of Benjin and uh, Sosnowiec at the beginning of the war. So we could identify real names of, of people because some of them were, were just, for example, you had, you had only, only surname without, 
without name, or for example, wife and children were not mentioned. They were also only mentioned as wife and children without names. So it was a, a huge, huge work by many people. Uh, we have ended having this uh, more than uh, 300, it's 3,253 3, names. But now after we found that Yehir Denur, famous uh, Israeli um, uh, Holocaust writer was also uh, in possession of a Honduran passport. We, we, we of course, we, uh, we added this name to the, to the list. Um, the list is still incomplete. We estimate that there were at least 8,000 and as many as 10,000 people in possession of Wadash passports. So what we are, have now is between 30 and 40 percent of the names. Uh, most of fa the fate of most of the people, a big part of the people on the list is still unknown. So we don't know what happened to them. It mostly concerns Polish Jews. Finally, well, we are still looking. We, we, now we, 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 we really cannot do much more than asking the Jewish community all around the world to look at the list and to find out whether their ancestors, your ancestors are there, whether you know people on the list, whether you know what happened to the people on the list, whether you know something about other people who are not on the list but should be there because you know that they have that they had passports. And finally, my last hypothesis is that there is one country we haven't really researched. It's Slovakia. It seems that it is not possible that Slovakia and Hungary, that so little Hungarians and Slovaks are on the list. So we are trying to find out whether there are any Slovak or Hungarian documents uh, saying more about it. Of course, I'm not going to do it myself because I'm already let's say, out of this story partially, but um, there are still historians who are working on it and, 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 and I, can, I can only appreciate their work and, and I can see what the, 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 the embassy in Switzerland is doing. It's an impressive work of popularizing and telling the story of Flavish. So, so this is what, 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 what more or less how, 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 we, how we, of course, this list contains error, errors as every scientific research. I'm not, you know, I'm not, uh, uh, we are not omnipotent. We are. We. we what. What we can do is is, is only present this. This uh, the, the, our work at, at at a given stage. So we really count on your help. I, I need to. I, I feel I need to add something which has been left out. Also left out in the film, which is also very important. That is the secret radio transmitter in the Polish okay. legation, which sent out information to principally to New York about what was happening. You know, the question that historians and uh, of the Holocaust are asking, when did the news of the Holocaust, when did it land in New York and in Washington and in London? When did people learn there what was happening to the Jews? So there are, there's the Regno telegram and there are all, all kinds of reports. Well, in the Polish legation uh, had a radio transmitter and uh, starting in 1942, news were being sent out from the Polish legation to the Polish consulate office in New York by the, the Consul General Strakas. And they then uh, informed the Agudat Israel, Isaac Levine, and Isaac Levine to other people. And they then appealed to the White House, to Eleanor Roosevelt. Reports coming out about what was happening to the Jews in Poland by that secret uh, transmitter in the Polish legation. I say that because uh, the uh, Cordell Hall, the American Secretary of State, uh, ordered the, the American Ambassador Harrison and Byrne not to further send information about what's happening in, uh, uh, in Poland and in other places, because that would increase the pressure on the American government to try to do something about it. So while the American Ambassador there in Bern uh, refused to send, uh, did not send information, uh, a few blocks away in the Polish legation, uh, they were sending out information on, on a weekly basis. Uh, Isaac Levine uh, uh, wrote on a daily basis. It landed, so this is very important. Some of the information was also about uh, the Polish uh, Jewish refugees that came to Switzerland mm -hmm. and needed money to be supported. And it just so happened that I was one of them. Uh, my parents uh, were Polish citizens. We lived in Belgium. When the Germans invaded, we fled to France and we went from one place to another, Marseille, Grenoble. And finally, when the uh, Italians surrendered, we were in the Italian zone, we crossed into Switzerland with the help of a, of a French uh, Catholic priest that uh, we honored at Yad Vashem. In Switzerland, we were interned by the Swiss 
and my, my father presented the Polish passport, so, so they wrote to the Polish legation, and the Polish legation then, and I have letters which uh, the ambassador Kumar sent to me, where the Polish legation said that they will uh, take uh, us uh, uh, under their charge, in other words, for the payment of money. So I was then six years old when I crossed into Switzerland, and I was helped uh, by the man in the Polish legation that was in charge of that was Julius Kuhl. So uh, in case you're interested, this is me and my sister. At that time, I'm six years old. You see, I was once uh, beautiful. I'm no longer. We don't see it, Mordechai. You're not showing us anything. Well, I'm, I'm pointing something on to, towards the screen. No, we don't see it. Oh, yeah, don't do it like that. You can hold up your phone to the screen or you can share your screen. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Hold it higher. Hold it higher. Uh, say something so it's on you. Uh, yeah, hold, hold the photo higher, like maybe in front of your face. And then we will all see it. Okay, this is me and my sister. We I don't see it. We don't see it. Hold it hi higher up. Yes, there you go. Okay, yeah. so this is me. I'm six years old. Uh, and my sister Annie, who is one year older, as we crossed into Switzerland, this may have been taken in France before we crossed, and uh, we were helped. Uh, I have a letter by uh, Stefan Rinievich that was addressed to the Swiss police uh, to ask that uh, they release us because uh, me and my sister, we were in a, one place in Switzerland, my parents were in a different place, and the police asked uh, for the uh, Swiss police to allow us to be reunited, which uh, we did. And we went to Geneva and the, the, the Polish legation helped us uh, uh, with money. And the money came from the United States, thanks to the secret radio transmitter, where messages went out uh, in coded language from the Polish legation to New York. And uh, it was disseminated there among uh, various sources. So this is something that I didn't see, didn't come out in the film. And, but that's a very important element uh, that needs to be mentioned. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, many of these letters that were sent out has Ladosh's signature on it. So this is something also that needs to be mentioned. Thank you. Uh, thank you. So, so there are a couple of more questions that I'd like yes, us to yes. add to. Um, so here's another question, uh, basically about the, the role of the Swiss the question is framed as follows. Is there any evidence that Swiss organizations such as the Swiss Red Cross or Secul Suisse, which were based in Bern, played any role in seeking these papers for Jews or in identifying Jews who needed papers? Yeah. You want to answer well, that, Ambassador? Go ahead. Well, first of all, coming back to the so-called Wadish cables, um, there is a very good article written in Hebrew and in English by Israel Hayom, uh, Eldad Beck is the author. It was published in December last year. It's really very long and ex with details explains what happened in Bern and wh what is the, the, the content of Wadash Cup cables. They refer to many aspects of Holocaust, including customs training, including bribing the Nazis. It's really uh, the lecture is quite heavy, so so uh, Eldad Beg did really a great job to, to, to write a detailed article about it. About the Swiss organizations, well, there were many Swiss men and women, Jews and non-Jews, who sponsored the passports for their friends, for their relatives. But this was, let's say, an individual rescue, mostly directed towards the the, the relatives, friends, and so on. Because the passports have, were, were quite uh, expensive. Well, the honorary consul of Paraguay, who was, by the way, no Paraguay, no links to Paraguay, he was a rich Swiss lawyer, took, he took more or less a, a salary of a medical doctor at that time, which was 500 francs, more or less like five, 6,000 francs today. Um, this was one per, per one passport. So, uh, who paid this money? Partially, Jewish organizations from abroad, who uh, basically, which 
paid the money or depo de would deposit the money with the Polish government in exile in London, the money would be paid in Bern from the reserve, gold reserves of the National Bank of Poland. The gold would be sold, changed into francs and used for bribes to bribe the consuls. That was the most frequent scheme. In some cases, it was Polish government who did. In some cases, as I said, relatives were involved, but I don't know anything about any institutional involvement of the Swiss state or Swiss public or private institutions, a part of Jewish ones. Unfortunately, in this story, Switzerland, the, the, the most positive thing what I can say about Switzerland is that they abstained from taking any actions against Polish diplomats because they were blackmailed by Wadosh. Wadosh said, you know, if you do it, we are going to make a scandal out of it. So they calculated in late 1943, they believed that there is no use of doing of doing uh, a, too much fuss around something which is already being over. Germany is losing war. There is no there is no there is no 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 reason to do that. Uh, let me just briefly come back to the previous question about Mantel, Mandelo. Mantelo. It is also quite important to know that Mandelo passports massively appeared in October 1943. And basically, he produced a lot of documents, but most of his documents were produced in 1944. The Wadosh operation basically ended in 1943, late 1943. The consuls of Paraguay, Honduras, Peru were fired. They were, there were no consuls to sell passports to the Poles. And at the same time, Chaim Eyes died. It was November 1943. Wadosh telegraphed to the government saying there, there's no possibility of obtaining other passports. But in the meantime, Chaim Eyes was replaced by Isaac Sternbuch. Isaac Sternbuch, who had an idea, like to uh, restart the operation. And he found, he localized Mantello, who was already quite in, 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 involved into the rescue operations. So they repeated the same scheme. The, the, the scheme, like let's produce passports of a third country without its knowledge, was applied by Wadosh probably for the first time in, 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 the, in, the, in the history of diplomacy. Later on, others used these patterns. It's very good that they did because this was to be used. Um, but, um, but there is also another aspect. Uh, a part of producing passports, Wadosh convinced the, the government of Poland to intervene with the Latin American capitals to recognize their fake citizens. And Paraguay, it must be clearly said, was one of the first countries who replied positively. In December 1943, the foreign minister of Paraguay, and we have this letter, so this is not a legend, this is a documented, a documented story, replied to the Polish ambassador in Buenos Aires saying that these passports are valid until the war in Europe uh, is going on. So Paraguay really contributed to the rescue of, of thousands of people. That must be clearly said. Some countries refused, some countries did not. But Poland, when they intervened, they did not intervene only in Paraguay because Wadosh didn't tell the government which country's passport he, he, he forged. He still claimed he didn't forge anything. So, so basically the intervention was in every Latin American capital, including in Mexico City, where Poland, uh, where the embassy of Poland was also accredited to Salvador. So Poles did it but also Jews did it. The Jewish organizations repeated the same intervention and the US repeated the same intervention. So that's uh, how after the coup d'etat in, uh, in, in El Salvador, the government, the newly established government of El Salvador recognized all Man Mantello and Castellanos passports. So Poland was not directly involved in the, in, in the production of the documents as, as far as I believe uh, based on today's knowledge but it was deeply involved in obtaining the recognition of them. Great. I wanna, I'd like to add something about Switzerland, the question about Switzerland. As we all know, uh, Switzerland had a policy, which in French we called refoulement. Thousands of Jews who tried to cross the border into Switzerland were sent back into France into, and they landed in German hands and uh, we know what happened to them. Uh, my family and I were lucky when we crossed into Switzerland and it was October 1943, the Swiss had changed their policy and they said that families that come with children would be allowed in. 
So thanks to the fact that I was a child and my sister was a child, and I, I had a little kid brother, uh, they allowed us to cross and they did not send us back into German hands. The other thing I want to mention is uh, there was in Bern the nuncio of the Vatican, the ambassador of the Vatican. His name was Filippo Bernardini. And uh, he also was involved in the sending information on the Holocaust to the Vatican. He got this information from uh, Sternburg, from Recha Sternburg, uh, who came to see him. And she asked him, send this information to the Holy Father uh, so he would know what's happening in the Holocaust. And Bernardini did send all the information. So now that there is a discussion uh, going on about what the Pope Pius XII knew, uh, Filippo Bernardini was one of the good nuncios who uh, had also communications directly uh, with the Vatican and he provided the information that he got from uh, Sternburg and from Zilberschein uh, to uh, the Vatican. Uh, that is in the year 1942 already. So we've reached the end of our hour. Um, we might be able to stay for a few more questions. We haven't gotten to all the questions that people have wanted to ask, but I wanted to mark the fact that this is uh, the end of the appointed time and to tell you a little bit about our upcoming events. So next Sunday is Mother's Day and we have this wonderful program, which is a book talk with Dr. Miriam klein Kasanoff and Joan Arne Halpern about uh, Joan Arne Halpern's book called My Sister's Eyes, having to do with her family's rescue and uh, exodus in 1940. Uh, but next Sunday is not only Mother's Day, it's also May 10th, which is a very important day because it's the 80th anniversary of the invasion of the Low Countries in 1940. And that's the date that many of these exodus stories uh, began. So it's going to be a very special event next week. I urge all of you to sign up for it. The following week is May 17th. There we have a very special guest who is the filmmaker Chelan Gluck, who made a beautiful film called Persona Non Grata about uh, the Japanese consul in Kaunas, Lithuania, uh, called uh, Chuni Sugihara. Then the following week, May 24th, we're having a presentation of the film about Sousa Mendes. It's called Disobedience, the Sousa Mendes story. And there's going to be a man who received a Sousa Mendes visa named Michael Spett, uh, who is going to be speaking with a Robert Jacobitz, who is a longtime activist in the cause to have Sousa Mendes recognized. The following week, we have a brand new film, which is called um, Safer in Silence. And it has to do with uh, anti-Semitism and intergenerational intergener trauma. It's the personal story of a woman who had no idea she had Jewish roots because these roots were actively hidden from her. And it's about her quest to find out uh, who she is. It's a very fascinating, beautiful story that was filmed over um, 40, a 40 year period. So you see the protagonist in the film and she's aging throughout the film. It's really quite fascinating. Um, then we're going to have more programming going into June, really as long as is necessary to uh, keep people connected while we're all in this, in this situation, uh, which we hope will be over by then, but uh, indications are that it probably won't be. So uh, I would like to take this opportunity to thank our two special guests today, uh, Ambassador Kum Kumosh and Dr. Mordecai Paldiel, and to ask them if they're willing to stay a little longer to answer some more questions. Yeah, I am. I am. Okay, in that case, we'll go to some more questions. So um, let's see. Uh, um, uh, there was a question about the Ghetto Fighters House in Israel for Dr. Paldiel. Have you considered asking the Ghetto Fighters House uh, uh, to create the recognition for Jewish rescuers if Yad Vashem remains uninterested? We have been thinking about this. Uh, 
but even uh, at the ghetto f uh, fighters house, uh, it doesn't seem that uh, we will be able to persuade them uh, because uh, they uh, think uh, that the ghetto fighters and the partisans, uh, these are uh, principally the, the main Jewish people that need to be honored. Why? They took up arms, they took a gun, and they fought the Germans. Uh, so these are the Jewish heroes, the true Jewish heroes. Uh, other Jews who didn't take up a gun and didn't shoot, uh, but they did other things, they were simply doing what was uh, expected of them. Uh, th that is the thing that uh, this logjam, we're trying to break this mentality thing that only people who actually took a gun and fought uh, are the people uh, who need to be honored, uh, I mean the Jewish people. Because they fought, they shot back at the Germans. So it, I, I am not very optimistic that we will be able to persuade the Lochamea uh, Getaot house that they will honor uh, the types of people that we discussed here under this program. So here's a question, I guess, for the ambassador, which is about one of the songs that's in the film. And that is, where can I find a copy of the song in the film? I see a window on the other side. Well, first of all, first of all, um, this is not the first time I have to explain that I'm not the author of the film, of the movie. As far as I understand, both songs who were used in, in the movie were especially written, I mean, the music was specially written for, for the purposes of the movie. The other song, the other song which is there, uh, meaning uh, I, I wish I had a Paraguayan passport, yes. Mm -hmm. um, there are several versions of this song. You can, you can Google it, they're, they're, they're in YouTube. So they're at YouTube, so you can, you can follow different versions of the same song, including uh, one in Hebrew by, um, uh, uh, by, a, by an Israeli group, El Hamishore, so if I'm not, if I'm not wrongly spelling it. I will try to find it uh, and post it, post it even, even, even now. But if you are interested in this story, I mean, don't hesitate to add me at, at Facebook. I, I'm, I'll, I'll be posting from time to time about, about uh, what we know about Walsh, what we know about his group and his people. So uh, I will accept every invitation that's, that's uh, from, from people who are, who are here with us. And, um, and don't hesitate to write about, uh, about tonight's meeting because maybe there are other people among your uh, friends, among your um, relatives who may know more. Uh, I'm really very impressed by those who, I mean, I'm, I'm, first of all, I'm shocked that so many people indeed had these passports that I personally met a lot of people I was completely unfamiliar with who, who came to me and told me, look, look, my father was on the list, should be on the list. He had a passport like, like that too, and his name is not there. Or um, uh, recently, a former general of Israeli Defense Force came to me and said, listen, uh, when I was a child, we were, we were told that we had a Latin American passport waiting for us in Moscow. He was in Lvov. So I was, I, 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 the more we speak about it, the more probable it is that we are going to find out the missing five to 7,000 names. This is my, 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 my biggest ambition. So. But uh, the song, as I, as I told you, unfortunately, I think Jacek Papis, who is here with us, will be better placed to answer this question because he took part in, in, in shooting this, this documentary. Okay. Now, um, you mentioned, uh, doc, uh, Ambassador, you mentioned before we began in a little private chat that you're quite convinced that there was a connection between this story and the Sugihara story. And it seems that we have the Sugihara filmmaker among our participants today. So tell me what you feel the connection might have been. Yes, uh, definitely it must be said that um, technically speaking, Sugihara did not rescue people directly from Holocaust. He rescued, he, he rescued people who were in the Soviet Union, in Lithuania and then Soviet Union, was before Holocaust. By giving him visas, he de facto rescued their lives. That's, that's true. But uh, as far as I understand, he was uh, he left Lithuania before uh, before the Germans really re reoccupied it, if I'm not wrong. But now um, the all Wadash operation, in fact, began at the same time, 1939-1940, and the first the the the, the uh, objective was not to rescue people from Holocaust because in 1940, basically no one could believe that the Germans were really going to do what they did. Uh, it was meant to rescue several dozens of Polish Jewish people from the Soviet Union. 
Polish Jews, who, first of all, uh, I know that for us it's, it's, it's something obvious, but not for everybody, is that Poland was not just attacked by Germany uh, on the 1st of, 1st of September 1939, but 17 days later, the Soviets attacked from the other side, definitely crushing the resistance and, 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 and uh, this Soviet aggression, in fact, uh, led to the complete collapse of the defense line and of the states. Before that, the army was still defending. So, um, so uh, many Jews tried to find safety in the Soviet occupied territories and they were trapped. They had no nationality, no right to obtain Soviet nationality, no possibility to escape because the Soviets did not recognize their passports. And then yeah, an idea was born to provide them with the documents of third countries. And Chune Sugihara basically gave them visas, but uh, many of them didn't need just visas, they needed passports. And um, Jacek Papis, who is here with us, actually found a document, very important document in the archive of the Jewish Historical Institute. The document is dated on, sorry, May 1941. May 1941 is before the Soviet-German war. Uh, the recipient is a person living in Lvov, in the Soviet in the, in the Soviet occupied part of Poland. Uh, the person is instructed, it's Rudolf Hugli again, the honorary consul of, of Paraguay. The person is instructed that he's been given a Paraguayan citizenship, is asked to send two pictures to receive a passport, and is reminded that he should obtain a Japanese visa and travel to Kobe in Japan. What does it mean? It means basically that these passports may have been used, several of them, for a Sugihara visas. Then the partner of Sugihara in Japan was Tadeusz Romer, the ambassador of Poland, and later on the minister of foreign affairs. Tadeusz Romer knew about Sugihara. Tadeusz Romer, we don't know how, had all the lists of people who, who would arrive to Kobe with uh, Sugihara's, Sugihara visas. Tadeusz Romer would convince the German, the, the, sorry, the Japanese authorities to let them in, despite some of them were, I don't know, there were 500 people on one single paper. Uh, many of the, he also organized uh, further migration for many of them because the Japanese didn't want them in Japan. They, they, want, they, they, they could help them to, 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 to leave the Soviet Union, but they, they wanted to, them to migrate further. Also, Tadeusz Romer in 1941 mentioned that the best way to help Poles, meaning he meant, of course, also Poles of Jewish nationality, ethnicity, was to provide them with passports of the third country. And the same Tadeusz Romer, later on the foreign minister, was Wadoś partner. He accepted, approved Wadoś operations, and he actually ordered all the embassies to intervene for the recognition of the Latin American passports. So, so, so these people basically, basically did the same. We also know that Sukihara closely co cooperated with the Polish military uh, intelligence called Dwójka, the second department. The, there are names of two officers who were his contacts well known. We also know there's no secret that Consul Konstantin Rokitsky, who forged more or most of um, uh, Paraguayan passports, practically all of them, was an officer of military, country, of military intelligence, as, as it was the case of many, with many diplomats at that time. So uh, we believe that, uh, unfortunately, the archive of Vujka, of the second department, are not there anymore. Uh, we don't we don't know where to local, localize them. They they mostly probably were burned during the war or stolen or or, or, or transported to Russia. We don't know, but um, but there are reasons to believe that the Vujka Second Department was deeply involved in the, in both operations. So there are two questions from the filmmaker Chelen Gluck, both for the ambassador. Number one. Sugihara was known to have issued several visas after leaving Kaunas in both Königsberg as well as from his post in Romania. And then he says, also it is rumored that a copy of the visa stamp may have been left or kept by members of the Polish underground. Well, definitely Sugihara, definitely Sugihara worked with the Poles as much as 
Wadosh worked with the Jews because without Paul, Sugihara would not be able to identify so many people who would provide them, uh, him with, with the details. With, I mean, let us imagine ourselves in such a situation. We are trying to save 10,000 people. How are you going to save 10,000 people? <laughs> Do you know 10,000 people? Do you know their addresses? Do you know their pictures? Do you know where they live? Do you know how to get to them? No, you need a network of people. And who knows them? I mean, Wadosh was per perfectly identified whom to work with, with the Jews. The Jews know the Jews, so so who is better 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 informed about the Jewish life in Poland if not Jewish representatives themselves? So he identified a secular one, Zilberschein, Zionist, left wing, and a religious one, Chaim Eis. The one would would know the Zionist circles, the other would know the religious circles. That was that was very well done operation. Now Sugihara. Who, 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 whom he, he needed. He needed people who, who had access to the, uh, let's say, the, the register of pre-war Polish population. Who, was, who are these people? Of course, people linked to the Polish state from, uh, from uh, before 1939. So, 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 so I'm not really astonished. It doesn't say, it doesn't take even one, it doesn't take any credit out of them. They, they acted properly as, as they should should have done. I want to ask something about Sugihara because I dealt in this case. Uh, the people who came to Sugihara were mostly uh, Polish Jews who were in Lithuania. The reason why they came to Sugihara uh, is not because they knew about Ladash, of course. And <laughs> no. Uh, no, but <laughs> the reason that they came there is before they came to Sugihara, they came to see uh, Zwartendijk, who was the Dutch uh, diplomat stationed in Kovno. And they learned from him that there was an island called Curaçao, in which uh, to get to that island in Curaçao off Venezuela, you don't need a passport, you don't need a visa. Why is that? Because you need a special permit from the governor, the Dutch governor on Curaçao. And the Dutch governor on Curaçao is not going to issue any permit because in Curaçao they were refining oil that came from Venezuela. But anyway, you don't need a visa. So they asked the Dutch uh, diplomat, are you prepared to put on my passport the fact that to get to Curaçao you don't need a visa and leave out the second statement that you need a permit from the governor? And he said, yes. So once they had this thing and then they looked on the map, how are we gonna get to Curaçao? They have to travel through the Soviet Union. But the Soviet Union are not going to give them a transit visa unless the Soviet Union was assured that they're not going to get stuck there. So that's why they looked on the map and they saw after the Soviet Union is Japan. Now, if they could travel Soviet Union, Japan, and then take a boat, the Pacific Ocean, and cross the Panama Canal, they would reach Curaçao. That's <laughs> when they came to Sugihara and they said, Sugihara, we just want to cross via Japan. And we got the money. But to get to Japan, we need the Soviet visa. And the Soviet visa, they want to see whether we have a, an end visa, an end destination. And therefore, would you kindly give us a Japanese transit visa because we want to go to Curaçao. So that's how, and we are Polish citizens and uh, we don't want to become Soviet citizens. They were already, uh, the Soviet Union was already in June. They had already, the Soviet army had already moved into Lithuania. So that's how Sugihara, became involved. Uh, incidentally, none of the thousands of Jews who received the Sugihara visa, not one of them came to Curaçao. Once they went to Japan, from Japan they went to Shanghai, and none, not one of them are from, from the Sugihara thing. So these Polish Jews were saved uh, by this uh, Japanese ambassador uh, in uh, Kovno. Uh, uh, he was sent there in Kovno to spy on the Germans, on the German military things, uh, because the Japanese uh, knew that Germany was about, was planning to attack the Soviet Union, but they didn't know when, and Hitler refused to give out the date, even to Japan, they were allies. The Japanese needed the information because they had a huge army stationed in Manchuria, and they wanted to use their army, but they were planning to attack the United States and Pearl Harbor. So, but anyway, uh, that's the story of Sugihara and the thousands of Jews that got the visas for Curaçao 
uh, uh, via Japan, via the Soviet Union. So now, uh, just, you've, now just, you've had a, a little preview of our program in two weeks. I hope you will all sign up for that. I also wanted to uh, mention uh, the Sousa Mendes Foundation. You can find us at SousaMendesFoundation.org. Today's program was free of charge, as you know. We're trying to keep these uh, programs either free or very low cost. And so, of course, we welcome any donation you might wish to give. Uh, and I encourage you to do so if you're able to do so. So a final comment from the ambassador and then a final comment from Dr. Paldiel. But before the ambassador makes a comment, I want to ask the ambassador a question. Uh, Jan Karski, was he in any, at any time aware of the passport scheme, uh, either when he was uh, in Poland or later on when he went to London and he went to Washington, was he ever told, did he ever know about this passport scheme? I mean, he was there in Poland in 1942, he was in Warsaw. Uh, he, he never mentioned that. Uh, what's your answer? Uh, I personally don't believe that Jan Karski was somehow involved in this, in this operation. I mean, why should he? he, was, did, he his, know, his, did he know about it? Did he know? I don't think so. I don't think that, that the government, why should the government inform, inform every, 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 every other civil servant that, 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 other, that, that an embassy was active in forging documents. I would say Karski has, Karski was young at that time. Karski had his own tasks of documenting what was going on in the German occupied Poland. He did his uh, task remarkably. Uh, I don't think there were many people informed about what Wadash was doing in, in Bern. Uh, the, the, the biggest proof is that no one knew about the whole operation. None of the participants really spoke about it after the war, which leads me to believe that they all, all somehow, I don't know, make an oath or, 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 or pledged not to tell. It was a state secret, so they kept secret. Um, I have also a, a, one remark, question maybe, but probably it's too late for questions. I mean, I have time uh, about Sugihara because it, it is unclear to me. Uh, we, we sometimes we mistake things when we speak about diplomatic rescue, uh, visas and passports. Visas, visa is um, uh, uh, is, a, is a is a consent of a state to 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 to, to come to the state. A uh, visa is basically stamped into a passport. But can you stamp a visa when you don't have a passport? Uh, sometimes yes, sometimes not. Now the problem is that the difference among Polish Jews in 1940 and German Jews in 1938 was very simple. German Jews have passports. They had German passports. Yes, marked with J, but it was still a valid travel document. So what they needed was visas. So if there was a consul illegally to issue a visa for, to them, like the Brazilian ambassador in Paris, like Sousa Mendes, like others, they could travel, they could leave. Now, Polish Jews in 1940 had nothing, no passports. I mean, Polish passports they, they, they had were completely worthless. It, it, they, they were only proof that these people were kind of like a property of the Third Reich and the Third Reich would eagerly murder them. So um, now the, the issue was not to prove that they were Poles. The issue was to prove that they were not Poles, that they were citizens of a third country. Now with Sugihara, the problem was that Sugihara could stamp visas, but to what passports? That was my, that's, that's always my, my, my question. The Soviet Union and the Germany did not recognize the existence of Poland after 1939. They believed it was over. The country ceased to exist. This, there were only two countries in the world who believed so. The country of Poland ceased to exist. Its, it, it, its passports were not valid anymore. So that's why if you wanted to get evacuated to Japan, you needed to prove that you were American, Swedish, Paraguayan, something like that. Uh, this, is, this is something I, I, I'm, I'm joining the meeting with, uh, uh, with um, I mean, uh, dedicated to Sugihara just to understand this, this, this because I, I, I mean, I'm not an expert in it. I'm trying to find out what, what, what was really going on and why uh, one of the relatives of Rabbi Weingart really needed a Paraguayan passport in Lvov to get a Japanese visa. So what, <laughs> what if he didn't have the pass, the, 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 
on the Paraguayan passports. Now our our research are going. I mean, our research the, uh, definitely we we try we are trying to find out whether there were any Paraguayan citizens crossing Japanese border in 1940, 1939, 1941. It would probably oh a very good Lithuanian La Sepa Se documents the, documents yes exactly until Lithuania was independent, it worked. Polish passports could also be used. Uh, well, it's it's interesting. I would I would I would I would know the details about it. That's that's. Uh, but anyway, anyway, this is that this is that this is the big difference between between us, and it's sometimes not understandable for people who are not of Polish origins, who, for example, who come from Germany or Holland, because the, uh, uh, their ancestors still the German Jews needed visas. Our Jews needed passports. That was, that was the biggest difference. And, uh, well, there were, many, uh, there were many refugees who had Polish passports, but those are the ones who had left Poland earlier, who were in Belgium and so but, forth. But I can, I can hear the rea reaction that somebody says that, 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 that she was in possession of, a, of, a, of visas and Polish passports during the war, right? Right. That would be very interesting to see. I mean, it would it completely change my mind because you know, I, it's diplomatic rescue is very, very complicated. And uh, you know, I, I, here among us, I can see, for example, Uri Strauss, who was uh, who, whose whose father was in possession of one of Wadesh passports and who was who was there as well when he was uh, three or four year old. And uh, for example, we can see in his passports there are Dutch and Belgian and Luxembourg Luxembourgeois visas from 1946, so it means that people used the Wadesh passports even after the war, which seems quite odd, but still they did, they did. We know the reasons why, partially because the Dutch Jews after the war were often treated as, um, sorry, German Jews who were, whose ancestors had been uh, refugees to Holland before 1940, after the war were treated like Germans, meaning citizens of an enemy country. And then, for example, to claim back their property, sometimes they used Paraguayan passports to say, I'm not German, I'm Paraguayan, and the, the factory belonged to my late, late husband. We, we, we saw such a, such, a, such a case. But, you know, it's very, very complicated. I mean, I, I, I'm the last one to tell you that I know everything about Wadash operation, that I know much about Sugihara, that I know a lot about Sosa Men as well. You, like, oh yeah, you know very well how difficult it was for you to, 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 to reconstruct the list you have of, 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 of the survivors. You know that the list is far from being complete. So, so doing such big projects, working with such, a big pro such big projects, we only know at the end of the day that how little, in fact, we know. Dr. Paldiel, would you like to say some final words? Yes. Uh, so we, I asked myself, we asked ourselves the question, why is it important that we mention all these stories? Why do we talk about Susan Mendes, uh, Sugihara, Lados? Why is that? I mean, what is the lesson that we can draw from this? It's not only to honor them and give them a medal and uh, raise the flags. I think uh, there is a, a moral dimension to all these stories uh, that we have to emphasize. Uh, society, civilization is based on the observance of law and order. We have to obey. There are certain rules that we have to go by in order to have an orderly society. But there comes a time when we have to disobey and we have to abide by a higher universal code of conduct. And sometimes we have to do things which under normal circumstances uh, we are not allowed to do. So, Susan Mendes disobeyed his government. Sugihara disobeyed. And usually diplomats are not permitted to disobey instructions that they get from above. Uh, Ladosh did something which is highly illegal. I mean, under normal circumstances, being involved in fabricating false passports would land a person like that in jail. Uh, but here they realized that we have to put all these regulations and all these uh, laws aside because there is a higher law, the sanctity of human lives and to save innocent hum human lives. So they abided by it. And that's the lesson that we have to teach uh, to future generation, that there comes a time 
when you have to uh, you have to swim against the stream. You have to do something uh, w because civilization is based on the actions of these people. Civilization is based on the action of a person like uh, Ladosh, Alexander Ladosh, who did not ask to be recognized. He did not ask to get a medal. He did not ask to get a tree. After the war, he disappeared from public scene. He was not heard of. But I, he, he did something which he felt he was obligated to do, not because he was a Polish citizen, because he was a human being. And that's the point. He was a mensch, a human being. And I have to do it. Even if I don't get thanks and acknowledgement and congratulations and nobody kisses me on both sides of the cheek. <laughs> I simply have to do it. It's illegal, but I can save these lives. So I'm going to do it. So that's the point that has to be emphasized. Okay, you don't have to be a saint. You don't have to be a Francis of Assisi. You don't have to be a Mother Teresa. You can be a, a diplomat and you can still do a very saintly act. And sometimes uh, we need people like that in every generation. So these are good examples that hopefully we can transmit to future generations. Thank you. So I'd like to thank both, both of our speakers. I'd like to thank all of you for participating and I hope to see all of you next Sunday and the Sundays after that. So have a nice rest of your day. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you.